Good afternoon by three seconds. Hey, everybody. Okay, so hi, you're 13. So we're going to be going through your paper six mock. I've got Julian and Wink here on the channel. Thanks very much for coming, guys. Do appreciate it. Bit disappointed that I haven't got more people. Um, but it's fine. You can watch it in their own time. So we're going to be going through your paper six. It was a... That I haven't got more people. Um, it was a tough paper six, by the way. It wasn't easy. But, you know, A2 chemistry is hard. So I'm going to crack straight on. I don't want to waste anyone's time. So I'm going to share my screen. I'll get rid of my YouTube video because I popped out the chat. So that's all there. Amazing. And I'll share my screen with you guys. Now let's crack on. I'm going to switch my cam to my clip cam just so I'm still there. Hey, Emma. Thanks for coming along. It's nice to see you. I do appreciate you attending. Uh, the paper six was hard. I'm going to do what I've been doing before. I'm a bit scared of this one, actually, going through these. The practical stuff is tricky. Okay, <clears throat> so I think we're up and running. I'll switch my tablet into tablet mode. <clears throat> now, rather than considering in the last review, it was a paper four and a paper five split, and I did the multiple choice, marked it, long answer, marked it, multiple choice paper five, marked it, long answer, marked it. In this case, since the paper is so much shorter, it's only out of 50, um, I'm just gonna run through this all the way through and then mark it at the end. It, the, these papers are tricky, but the great thing is they're very repetitive. So um, hopefully you can gain a bit of insight into how I do the process. Like I said, I'm gonna complete it as if I'm you. Um, okay, so question number one, just, if you wouldn't mind, can someone just give me a quick shout on the chat if everything's working okay? You can hear me all right and you can see my screen. That would be great. Okay. So, cupronickel. Oh, coins. I like it. Cupronickel is an alloy of copper and nickel and is used to make silver coins. A coin is analyzed by the following method. They weigh down a balance, four grams, yada, yada. Okay, I'm not going to skip all that. State why in step two uh, is water added before rather than after the acid. Okay, why is water added before? So if you looks good, thanks, Winkit. So that question is very common. So th th there's this rule in chemistry that you never, you never ever ever add water to an acid, especially a concentrated one. The reason being, just to explain this in a little bit more detail than I probably would normally, if you've got a concentrated acid, you, you never need much of it. You have a tiny amount of, con let's say conch, uh, which one did they use? Did they use conch sulfuric? Conch nitric and conch, oh, uh, that's terrifying. So they've got a mixture of conch nitric acid and sulfuric. This is scary to the best of times. And what they now do is, if you now add water to it, if you add H2O to this, it is a very, very exothermic reaction. And what you can actually do is, it would boil the acid almost immediately. You'd add it, you add the water and it goes, it'll just boil it all away and turn it into gas. And that is definitely not what you want. So what you do is, you do the reverse. You have loads of water, and you add in your small amount of conch acid. The reason being is, if you add in, when, you, when the acid goes in, you've got a large body of water to heat up, so it keeps it relatively cool. Instead of having a small body of water to heat, so the temperature then increases exponentially very, very rapidly, this one is gonna go up much more slowly because you've just got a larger body of water to heat. So you never ever, so that I'm actually going to put two bullet points in here. I'll do it in red like I was doing yesterday. So number one is um, the reaction is very exothermic. The reaction is very exothermic. Exothermic. Um, second bullet point could, could boil, could boil acids could boil acids and release corrosive gases. Corrosive gas, not good. I think that would be a reasonable one. Be interesting to see what they want in the mark scheme for that. 
What is the color of an aqueous iodine? Aqueous iodine. Now, it's a tricky one, that. It's in the presence of Ki, so it's brown. I know that's really horrible, guys. Right, just to explain. Uh, iodine is not very soluble. If you have, if you've got a beaker of water and you add iodine as your solid gray powder, it'll just sit at the bottom as solid gray powder and you'll form like a pale, 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 pale. It really won't really do anything. Like it, it's not really soluble at all. So <clears throat> my question, that's a tricky one. Can I just point out that this is quite unusual to ever really talk about, but then if you add Ki, if you add Ki, it becomes much more soluble because you have ion dipole interactions, and now the whole solution turns dark brown. Iodine water is brown. <clears throat> Can I just point out that's a detail really that's very rare to come up with. They're asking you for what color iodine is in the solution. It means it's in solution, which means it's going to be brown. To make the end of the titration more obvious, an indicator is added to, uh, before the color of the iodine disappears. So, okay, they weighed out a mass of four grams on the balance. The water is added uh, The water is added to the coin in the beaker. Concentrated acids are then acid and the coin dissolves. The coin is completely dissolved in the solution. In the, um, when the coin is completely dissolved, the solution is neutralized. The neutral solution is transferred with the washings to a 100 centimeter volumetric flak and made up to the mark uh, and mixed with thoroughly. Yeah, okay, homogenizing it, homogenizing. 10 centimeter sample of this solution is taken and potassium iodine is added to produce iodine. Potassium iodide is added and iodine. Okay, so it's it's right. They've added an excess and iodine is produced. The iodine is then titrated with sodium thiosulfate. <clears throat> okay, so the indicator we're going to use here is starch. Starch is the indicator because we're going from iodine to no iodine. Now, just to tell you that, people often go, why do you need... Why do you need an indicator if it's already dark brown anyway? Yeah, and I totally understand the question. I really do. Yeah, because in reality, it starts off this color anyway. But here's the thing. As you titrate this, as the titration continues to happen, what happens is it will get paler and paler. Yeah, it'll just get... The iodine gets used up and it will get paler and then it'll get paler again. And we all know here, it'll get paler again. Yeah, and we all know that for a titration to work, we need to see, boom, color change. Yeah, we need to say, vanish, all in one go. Well, I think everyone here would realize that this is going to be bad for a titration. Yeah, bad for titrations. Definitely gonna be bad here. Yeah, but what we're going to do is we're going to do a really clever trick. We're going to add the iodine at this point. Sorry, I'm sorry. We're going to add the starch at this point. What that means is all of a sudden that pale, pale, pale brown now becomes dark blue. And we're really near the end. So now, when we now do the next part of the titration, it suddenly disappears and goes colorless. So that's a really clever trick. You go dark brown, light brown, really pale brown, add your starch, turns blue black, then goes vanishes. It's a really clever process. Um, so we're gonna add it. And so what is it? the question says, why is the indicator not added to the iodine solution earlier in the titration? Yeah, that's a good question there. Uh, the reason why is you'll get flocking. Mm. Um, the... The iodine starch complex, complex, uh, it's called flocking. Now you can't, you're not gonna want to write flocking down in your exam. Flo I'll put flocks. <laughs> flocks together, flocks together. Now what that means is you form these little black lumps. Um, flocks together forming a black insoluble insoluble solid so if you add it too soon if you add it too soon if you add the starch at this point here it'll become it'll become black because 
the iodine is so intense to prevent an insoluble compound forming. Yeah, so it'll become black, but then as you proceed in the titration, those black bits form together into this black, this is what's called flocking, to form this black solid. And that black solid then will just kind of gather at the bottom and it, it, it won't, then it'll, it'll settle out, by the way, it'll precipitate out and all kinds of problems. But it forms this inside but that won't re-dissolve on the excess. So this process here won't happen. So I'll put flock. I wonder if they have flocking on the mark scheme. It's being it flocks together, forming a black insoluble solid, which won't disappear then at the end of the titration. Give the color change at the end point when this indicator is used. So the end point is going to be blue, blue, black, blue, black to colorless reasonable uh to prevent an insoluble compound forming uh yeah wink it that's what i've put forming yeah so yeah prevent do you know what wink it i think you've just given me a mark there if added early if added early i think you've just given me a mark there wink it i think i may have missed that because yeah if added early, the iodine starch complex flocks together, forming a black insoluble solid. Yeah, it, so it would prevent it. Yeah, Winky, I think you may have just given me a mark there. I don't. I think I would have been mean and not given it to me because I haven't said what it would have done if it had gone in earlier. Although it'd be interesting to see what it says on the mark scheme. We'll see. Let's continue. Right, work out titrations. Well, that one's easy because it starts at zero. That's complete garbage anyway. But anyway, forty-seven point nine minus twenty-four point one zero s to d. 23.80. I wonder how many people are going to forget that zero because your calculator will make it vanish. Yeah. That's that. They've done that on purpose, folks. That is deliberate. I'm trying to raise my chair, by the way. Uh, yeah. Um, they've done that on purpose. Yeah, because it's going to make the zip. The, that zero will vanish on the calculator as it has done on mine and everyone forgets it and you lose that mark. The next one, 23.55. The next one, 47.00 minus 23.55. Yeah, 23.45. So that there, I think, is one mark. And isn't that funny? The, the place that everyone will lose it is they'll forget that zero, and then they'll lose that mark. Clever game, that. It's all a trap. Next, which titrate titers should be used to calculate the mean? Uh, I'll get rid of those little green crosses now. So carry on. There you go. Uh, it's going to be him and him because they're within 0.1. So I'm going to say 23.55 and 23.45 centimeters cubed uh, due to them being concordant. Concordant. Concordance is within 0.1, which they are. Yeah, they're within 0.1. Uh, I wrote within concordance, within 20, ha, <laughs> oops, yeah, wink it, you'll lose it for that, yeah, yeah, due to them being concordant within 0 0.1, not 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. Only one mark though, interesting, calculate the mean. Uh, and it's only one mark, so it doesn't really matter. Five, five plus twenty-three point four five, all over two, twenty-three point five zero. Nice, seems reasonable. Centimeters cubed. Don't forget your units. Still got the mark. Oh, I would have taken it off yet. Isn't it zero point two? No, that's GCSE. If Edexcel accept that for A level, they're morons. That's GCSE, Julian. It's within 0.1. Any good chemist will tell you that. Any good chemist. Moving on. Should have put my writing in red, really. Okay. Call it the percentage mass in the copper in the coin. Okay. So, iodine is titrated. They've given us a concentration of the thiosulfate, and we now have a volume of the thiosulfate being my titer. So, first step, number one, moles of thio. Moles of thio, which is this guy. Yeah, moles of thio. 
So number of moles is C times V over a thousand. So number of moles equals my concentration was what? My concentration was 0.2. 0.2 multiplied by my volume of 23.50. My meter, 23.50, all over a thousand. C times V over a thousand. 0.2 times by 23.50 divided by a thousand gives me the moles of thiosulfate at 4.7 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Mole. Right, now look at my equation. I've got, this is, I'm working out the amount of iodine here and then the iodine's over there. So the ratio, step two is the ratio. Ratio is 2 to 1. S2O3 to minus to iodine. So divide it by two. So moles, moles of I2 equals that 4.7 times 10 to the minus three divided by two. Divided by two, S to D. That gives me 2.35 times 10 to the minus three moles of iodine. Right, we're trying to get back to copper. Now, the great thing is if you move within equations, you use the ratio. If you move between equations, you do nothing. So that number there goes straight in there, 2.35 times 10 to the minus three. Right, so I just follow this number straight because I found out what it is here. I'm just gonna move it straight into that equation. Right, now what's the ratio of him to copper? The ratio there is a one to two. So the next ratio, so ratio is a one to two, and that's iodine to copper two plus. The great thing is copper two plus weighs the same as copper metal. So I'm just gonna go, so copper, so 2.35 times 10 to the minus three multiplied by two. We're gonna go this way to find copper. The great thing is that gives me exactly the same number I started. What was that point in there? So stupid. So I've now got moles of copper two plus. Now the thing is though, I will have taken a sample, won't I? Yeah, because they took a 10 centimeter sample and they had it in a 100 centimeters cubed um, flask. So I'm gonna multiply that by 10 next. Step four is times it by 10 because I took a sample. Took a sample times by 10, so that becomes 4.7 times 10 to the minus two moles of Cu2 plus in the whole thing. Next. Um, that was all dissolved from four grams. So that there is the total moles of copper in the mixture that came from the coin. So what that now means is that is that that is equal to the moles of copper metal. Yeah. Just to explain why, because the copper metal is losing two electrons to the acid, but we know that electrons mass is negligible. So the mass of the copper two plus ions is gonna be the mass is the, the same as the mass of the metal that they added. So what we now need to do is we now need to convert that to grams. So step number five, number of moles is grams over rams. I've got moles, I've got rams. Copper weighs 63.5 on the A-level table. So rearrange number of moles times rams gives me grams, input my data, 4.7 times 10 to the minus two times by 63.5. So times by two gets me back to 4.7 times times by 10, gives me that guy. Right, multiply that by 63.5, and I get a mass of equals 2.98 grams. Right. Calculate the percentage by mass. Right, what was the original mass was four grams. That was easy to remember. So the percentage by mass is 2.98 over the original four grams times 100. 2.98, keep that on my calculator, divided by four times 100, times 100, S to D, total 74.6%, winner. I didn't use that number. I used to real one of my calculator, by the way, I only did rounding errors. Perfect, I'm done. Sounds like a very reasonable thing for a cuckoo nickel coin. Sounds very reasonable to me. Right. The uncertainty in each burette reading is this, and the uncertainty in the reading of the balance is this. 
Calculate the percentage uncertainty in the third titration. Titration, 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 it has an accent. Calculate, calculate the percentage, oh no, I lost it. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in the third titration. What was my third titration? All that. 23.45. So the uncertainty, first mark, percentage error is plus or minus value, plus or minus value over the value taken. So input my data, percentage equals, what was the plus or minus for the third titration? Titration, plus or minus 0 0.05. But we know that we always take two readings on a burette at the start and at the end. The value taken was 23.45. Right, let's run it through. So 0 0.05 times 2 divided by 23.45. S to D times 100. Oh, forgot it. S to D. Don't forget times 100. If you forget that, you'll lose it. Yeah, so the total is 0.426% for the third titration. Third titer. Okay. It then says, color the third and, and it's mass. And in the mass measurement, four grams. Measured out four grams. Use the results to decide if using a balance that weighs to three decimal places would significant improve the accuracy. Right, we did four grams, so that's the percentage error in the tighter. I want percentage error in the scales. The plus or minus value for the reading on the balance was 0 0.005, and we took four grams times 100. 0 0.005 divided by 0 0.4, no, divided by four times 100. S to D. Gives me 0.125%. By the way, we only take a mass reading once. You don't take a mass reading twice unless you're doing weighing by mass. If you do weigh by mass change, then it requires two. But in this case, they weigh the coin and when it weighs four grams and then throw it into a beaker. Only one reading. Only one reading. And what you realize is it's not worth going any better because the error, the error in the two decimal place balance is less than the error in the titration, in the titer. What that means is there's no point in spending more money on a better set of scales because you're only going to, and that's your max error. That's going to be more error than anything else. Not worth it. So I'm just going to write down that that is smaller than 0.426%. So no point um, better graph. Better scales. Yeah. No point better scales. Because you're only going to reduce that, but it doesn't matter. The max error is going to be caused by the big one. It's clever that. Like that. Next, next question. Okay. Bromobenzene. Oh, okay. Bromobenzene can be prepared by benzene in the following steps. Reflux, 20 centimeter cube benzene with bromine and about 10 grams of iron filings. By by uh, by heating it on a water bath of 50 degrees Celsius. After the reaction is finished, remove the water bath and heat the boil until no bromine vapor has been. Oh, okay, heat and boil until the, no bromine vapor can be seen. Cool the mixture and add 25 centimeters cube of epoxy ethane to extract the bromobenzene. Wash the epoxy ethane with aqueous sodium hydroxide. Separate the epoxy ethane layer. Wash the epoxy layer with water and repeat the separation. Dry it with a suitable drying agent to count the, the dried solution. Holy moly! Okay, calculate the moles of bromine. Well, right. I put in, I put in six centimeters cubed of bromine, and it given me, they've given me density. Nice. So six, six multiplied by its density, three point one three, gives me the grams of bromine I use. Six multiplied by three point one, that's going to give me eighteen point six grams. Of, of, of BR2, BR2. But they haven't asked us for grams, they've asked us for moles. Number of moles is grams over grams. Bromine's heavy. 80, 160, <whistles> over 160.0. I will check the A-level table for that, though. What does bromine come up as? 80, 80.0. No, about to lose my mark. 79. 
79.9, about to lose it. GCSE. So uh, I'm going to do BR2 is 79.9 times by 2. 79.9 times 2 gives me 159.8. 59.8. Yeah, okay, next. 18.6 divided by answer gives me, and that's it, 0.116 moles of bromine. BR2, winner. Bromine reacts with iron to form iron 3 bromide, which reacts with bromine to produce the attacking electrophile. Write the chemical equations for these reactions, okay? Iron methyl plus bromine goes to iron 3 bromide. Oh, my little, my little, my little fan, which keeps my laptop cool, has just died. There we go, I'm back on. Balance the equation, balance equation. So that's now gonna be one and a half. Make it easy for myself. Do I need state symbols? Well, iron's gonna be a solid. The bromine's gonna be liquid. And that's gonna be, ooh, iron three bromide. Is there anything around? Uh, it's gonna be a solid probably. It's covalent though. It's gonna be solid. State symbols aren't quite. Game yeah, must taste it. Okay. Right, next second equation. This then reacts with more bromine to produce the electrophile. Uh, so it's doing the same thing as the aluminium chloride. So we're going to get FeBr4 mm, plus and B. No, ah, 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 ALC, I think. There we go. There we go. So that's a clever game there. It's coming from aluminium chloride. We know that if we want to take benzene and we want to add a chlorine group to it, what we take is we take chlorine and react it with AlCl3, and the AlCl3 just rips off a chlorine to produce these guys. And so it's a clever trick that I like that them changing it to bromine and with iron instead. Fascinating, clever. Oh, I wonder how many people managed to figure that out. Why is the epoxy ethane washed with sodium hydroxide solution in step four? Wash the epoxy ethane layer with aqueous sodium hydroxide. Separate the epoxy ethane layer. Wash the eth okay. Reflux 20 centimeters cubed of benzene with six centimeters cubed of bromine and about 10 grams of iron catalyst by adding to a water bath. After the reaction is finished, remove the water bath and heat to boiling until no more bromine vapor has been seen. So we're boiling off the excess bromine. Cool the mixture and add 25 centimeters of ethoxy ethane to extract the bromobenzene. Okay. So let's draw this out. It's a fascinating process. Hard this. So we had we had a mixture of benzene, mixture of benzene and bromine, and iron catalyst. An iron catalyst. At the end of the heating process, what we're going to have is we then go we're with this really weird we're forming a mono sub. Can have all kinds of wonky stuff. Bromobenzene, they're wanting to form bromobenzene, which is this mono substitution at 50 degrees, you're probably gonna get multiple. Yeah, we're gonna have leftover bromine, which they're gonna boil away, and then we've got a catalyst. Yeah, the iron. Now the iron forms iron BR3, which is the catalyst. Now at the end of this reaction, now we lose a H. We will lose a H. If we go back to those benzene equations, when you do this reaction of uh, benzene with chlorine, what we end up getting is you get chlorobenzene, chlorobenzene, and you get HCl as a byproduct. Now, the reason for that is because the the aluminium the aluminium trichloride reacts with the chlorine and rips off the Cl to form AlCl4. Uh, minus, plus, minus, minus, 
and Cl+, plus, which is the electrophile, which is what benzene needs. Benzene needs an electrophile. Have I made mistakes from my equations? No, okay, yeah, okay, 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 okay. So it forms the electrophile, yeah? Now, the next thing is then, how is this a catalyst? Well, the reason being is, in the next step of the reaction, when we can do the full mechanism, so we're going to put the chlorine here. So the chlorine is fully positive. The ring reaches out, hops over that corner, so we know where we're putting it. And so the chlorine here appears here, and that appears there, and my horseshoe is broken. My horseshoe is broken, and now the H hops off. Now, the next thing is that in this, in this reaction, the H plus now reacts with the negative ALCL4 minus, and it regenerates my catalyst, and it'll make an acid. So the reason why they're adding sodium hydroxide is because the byproduct of this, which won't be driven off, so they're driving off the bromine in the heating. Well, the HBr byproduct is still going to be in there. So they're going to want to neutralize it to form sodium bromate, sorry, sodium bromide. So the washing, the NaOH, NaOH is there to neutralize is there to neutralize. Dollar, can you go find the watch which is beeping? Oh, it stopped, it's gone. NaOH is there to neutralize the HBr byproduct. Byproduct. Can't think of any other reason. Man, I'm losing my confidence to take chemistry to my A levels just by watching this. Meter. You are watching A2 chemistry. This is as hard as it gets. You have two years before this. Don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. It, 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 it gets easier. Everything's done in stages. You're not meant to be... Mita, I should tell you to stop watching my A2 lessons. It's a bad idea. <laughs> it's because you don't know this is all new, but they, they have learned this in stages. I promise you, it's not as bad as it looks. Next, draw a diagram of the apparatus used to separate uh, the epoxy, like epo epoxy ethane layer. So this is a separating funnel. Needs a tap. There's a separating funnel. Clearly labeling the label the epoxy, epoxy ethane layers. So we're gonna have two layers. The water layer is on the bottom and the ethoxy ethane, because it's lower density than the water, so it'll float. Ethoxy ethane layer, it's on top. There we go. I'll probably put a cap on that as well. There we go. The bromobenzene form in this reaction can be nitrated to make 2,4-dinitrobromobenzene. Identified by names of the chemicals needed to do this. Concentrated conch nitric, conch nitric, acid, and conch sulfuric. Nice, easy. There you go. Next. Okay. Yeah, you're looking at the, the meter. You are watching the hardest chemistry there is at A-level. This is as hard as it gets. And you're at GCSE yet. You've done no A-level. It gets easier the more you do. I promise you. Next. Given us a whole sequence of events, oh God. State the most important hazard associated with phenol in this experiment and the precaution you would take to reduce the risk, apart from wearing safety goggles and a lab coat. <clears throat> well, in my opinion, the toxic one is the most important, but unless you're eating it or breathing it in, um, and phenol is a solid, phenol is a solid at room temperature. Oh no, phenol solution. I wouldn't want to get it on my hands. Oh, uh, we've got phenol in school. It's totally safe to, by the way, have around. It's just don't drink the stuff. Um, I'm going to say toxic. Toxic. Uh, now, phenol doesn't fume. It doesn't produce a gas. So, uh, toxic. Hi, Ian. Ian, are you actually going to try and watch my A2 lesson as well? Please don't. It's not a good idea. 
By the way, meter Ian is in year 10. I am baffled by this question. If something was toxic, you wouldn't want it. It's not like wear gloves because it's not going to help you. Oh, it's a trap. Everything here is a trap. Toxic, wear gloves to avoid, to avoid skin contact. But then skin contact would be an irritant. Oh, this one stumped me. Wear gloves to avoid skin contact. Corrosive. I'm gonna switch. I'm switching to this one. They've got a picture of a hand here. I'm gonna go for that one. Mm, I'm gonna get it wrong. Explain the purpose of phenol in this experiment. Right. Guys, this is inc this, these practicals are incredibly hard. Do bear that in mind. Okay, let's draw this out. Measure 10 centimeters cubed of aqueous phenol solution into a boiling tube. Okay. So we add phenol, I should make this bigger, add phenol to our reaction, to our vessel, and then add an indicator of methyl yellow to turn it yellow. Okay. Phenol, boiling tube, five drops, of the, it turns yellow, the alkali solution of methyl red. Okay, fine. So it's turned yellow. Add five centimeters cubed of aqueous potassium bromide and 10 centimeters cubed of dilute sulfuric acid to the boiling to a to the boiling tube. Okay, they're in the same thing. Okay. So we're now gonna add to this KBR. Potassium bromide's not gonna do anything. K plus and Br minus. Well, that's not gonna do anything with the phenol because in order to react with benzene, it needs to be positive, and the potassium certainly ain't going to do it because it's a group one metal. So next, the measure 15 centimeters cubed into a second boiling tube. So they've now added potassium bromate. Okay, potassium bromate. Uh, second test tube, 15 centimeters cubed aqueous. Mix the contents of the two boiling tubes together. Okay, so we mix the boiling tubes together. Now what's going to happen inside the beaker? Inside the beaker, the phenol certainly won't react with any of those other two. In order to react with that, so we've now got the reaction between Br- and the bromate. That's what's happening. Now, I'm then going to form, I'm then going to form, these two, by the way, would be repelled by benzene, if you're wondering. These two are going to form bromine and the bromine and water. Okay. Now, phenol will react with bromine water. We know this. That's what it's there to do. The question is why? It's going to react with the bromine and mop it up. Measure, point to record the time when the color of the methyl red is bleached from red from red to colorless by excess bromine. Oh, okay. So the bromine being made, will we react with the benzene to form tribromoben, tri, oh, tribromophenol, which is a white precipitate, if you remember. So it will react, removing the bromine. Now, when once all the phenol is used up, I have excess bromine, and it will change color. Nice. What's the purpose of the phenol? Two marks, damn. Um, to react, to react with the bromine product. To react with the bromine product. Um, to allow this reaction to be measurable. Because if you didn't have the phenol, if you didn't have the phenol there, 
if the if the phenol just didn't exist, then what would happen is you'd see it change color immediately. It it would just be too fast to measure. It would just start to turn orange immediately. And you can't really measure that. So I'm going to say the phenol is there to react with the bromine product to uh, make the, the rate of reaction, rate of reaction measurable. Reaction measurable because, because, <laughs> because it, it otherwise would be too fast. Oh, otherwise be too fast? No idea, it's hard that. Suggest so a way of making the disappearance of the methyl red color um, easier to see. Oh, white tile. Uh, titrations, that is, guys, that's just titrations. Titration theory. If you want to make a, it easier to see the color change of an indicator, then you just use a white tile. Add a white tile. Next, I'll put use. <laughs> Next, state why the total volume is kept constant. Okay, the students' results are shown here. So we've got the bromate is being changed. This one's constant, this one's constant, and then the water's changing. And then we have time, and then one over time. Okay. Plot a graph of the reciprocal one over time against the bromate. Okay. Ah, God, you wouldn't get that answer unless you'd seen the graph first. That's really mean. So, guys, A2 rates, A2 rate graphs. So, you've just got to remember, guys, that in terms of A2 rate graphs, we have, so we've got concentration against rate, yeah, and that is 0, 1, and 2. But then we also have the half-life graphs, which is time and then concentration. Conk. Like, we have these two graphs as well, don't we? And then, whoo, yeah, we have these two graphs as well. So, and this one is this one. We've got rate being given as 1 over t. And concentration usually goes on the x-axis. But we're not putting concentration on the x-axis, are we? What we're putting on the x-axis is volume of bromate. So the reason why we keep the volume constant, total vol, total vol kept constant. So volume of bromate or bromate is proportional proportional to concentration so we can plot it instead <laughs> oh god that's so amazing so we can now plot the graph of the vol of the con the vol of the bromate on here and the one over t over here and it's the same as doing it's the same as doing conch because they're proportional to each other it's really clever gonna get the same graph right it then says plot your data so, uh, volume 15, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4. 15, 12, 10, what? So, it's going to start at 4. That's awkward. I want to know if 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15. Oh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15. That sucks. I'm going to do 14, 16. Fine. And then... I'm then going to do on the 1 over t. Ugh, that's gross. Oh, it's grim, that. Don't like it. Biggest to smallest. Blimey. Um, um, Zero to naught point two naught point naught two five. That's horrible, isn't it? Um, what's horrid? Don't like that. Uh, it's always worthwhile practicing doing these graphs. They're really tough. Um, I don't know. Naught point naught two five. Let's make it three to make it easier for myself. One two three. Oh, that was four. That's awkward. 
can't do any better. Okay, that's fine. I'll go to there. 0.03. But then if I do that, no, I can't. Oh, this is horrible. So hang on a minute. 0.025. It's really awkward. Don't like that. Yeah, I'm gonna. It's more than half the page. Fine. 0.025. I'm just gonna go to there. I don't care. It doesn't fit very well. That's horrible. Don't like that. So my graph's gonna be like like this or something. I don't know. Plot my numbers. So that's 15. 15 is here. Just there. There's my last point. I believe. Yeah, 15. I've just plotted that. Set a data there. Then 0 0.2 is 12. 0 0.2 is 12. Yeah, because that's going to be 0 0.020, and then 0 0.015, and then 0 0.010, and then, is this correct? Getting smaller? The 0 0.005, there we go. So then the next one is going to be 10, is it 0 0.16? 10, 0 0.016, there we go. Then the next one is going to be 8 at 0 0.2. One four eight at zero point one four. Awkward. There, and then the next one that's eight, and then six is at zero point one. Six is then zero point one, and then it's going to be a straight line. Then four, four at zero point zero six five. Four at zero point zero six five. Nice. Straight line through the origin. How funky is that? Is it actually through the origin as well? I believe so. <gasps> oh no, my laptop is something strange. It's just, I've just lost my connection to my extra screen. That was all. I like it. There we go. So it's first order, certainly about the bromate. State the order of the reaction first, uh, about the bromate ions, that's first, first order. Next, the reciprocal one over time is used, by the way, I've lost my chat now. Oh no, hang on one sec. Lost Mr. Duncan. Would the examiners check each individual plot? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Yeah, they would. Yeah, to a certain extent, Ivan. Um, tricky that one to answer that. Yes, they will. They'll check each one. That That's part of the game. What they'll do is they'll go, yes, 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 yes. And then they go, one mark. Yeah, they will check each one. Yeah, to a certain extent. If you make any incorrect plot, you lose that mark. Next, the reciprocal one over time is used to measure the rate of experiment. Suggest why the assumption on which this depends refer in your answer to the shape of the typical graph of reactant concentration against time. Okay, so the reason why we can use one over t from GCSE um, is about a fixed amount of product. We can use, we know that rate rates of reaction is the change in the concentration of product or reactant and in this case it's the reactant over the change in time now we learn that at gcse that sticks for meter and then we also learn at gcse that sometimes we can use the rate as one over t now the reason when this happens is when the change in reactant uh, or the change in product is a fixed amount. If I make, you know, this is the most common one for this, is the stupid thiosulfate practical from GCSE, where you have underneath the thiosulfate, you've got a cross, yeah, you've got this solution of liquid, yeah, and underneath it is a cross. Yeah, do you guys remember this? Me to remember, she's doing it now. We have this cross underneath it. And what we're doing is we're looking, yeah, we're looking above it, looking above it, 
to be able to see when the cross disappears. And we stop the clock when the cross vanishes because we have a fixed amount of sulfur blocking the view. Now, the problem is we have to relate this to the graph. So we are, are we making a fixed amount of product here? Until this, yeah, because, because the phenol is the fixed point, isn't it? The phenol is absorbing as a fixed amount of bromine. Yeah. So each reaction that we're doing, so the first bullet point, you've got to draw the graph. Refer in your answer to the shape of the typical graph, and they've given us this big space. They want me to draw the graph. Oh, hang on a minute. Typical graph for reaction against uh, reactant concentration against time. Reactant concentration against time. And this is first order. So this is time, and this is reactant concentration. So that's that's zero. That's zero. This is first. This is first. First order is the curve. So the first thing is I'm going to say is that um, the end point, the end point of all reactions, of all reactions is the same uh, due to fixed amount, fixed amount of phenol reacting reacting with br2 br2 product the next thing is in reference to the graph now we can only do this with 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 these graphs linking this back to oh why am i done something just to link this back to the graphs in a2 chemistry we know that rate graphs do this and the only bit that we deal with, the only bit we deal with is the initial rate, is this linear portion of the graph. You can't do any further reaction. You can't do any more rate determining with a further bit because it's going to be changing all the way through. Well, as long as it's occurring inside that linear portion, then you can use 1 over t. So last bullet point there. This is only one mark. You suck. Um, all reactions, there was, they're saying we're using this, so all reactions, all reactions produce, produce a result within, within the linear, running out of space, linear section of graph, of graph. By the way, which I'm going to highlight. There's the linear section of the graph, the straight line yellow bit. So it has to occur in this region. Yeah. All the reactions must produce their, their data within that section because otherwise the data's way out. Wouldn't be any good. It's grim that. I don't like it. Another student accidentally measured 8.5 centimeters cubed of bromate rather than 8. Explain whether or not this proportion of potassium bromate should be discarded. Um, it's continuous variable. 8.5 would fit in here. Well, he doesn't have to discard it. He'll have to adjust his water volume to match. But you just plot that he's got a bigger gap between these two. It's no issue for him to have 8.5. Uh, and eight, eight, It's going to be a pain to plot. But he'd be plotting the graph there. That's all right. It's a continuous graph. I'm okay with that. Doesn't need to discard it unless it was a um, a a, a uh, no. Unless it was a discrete variable. It's the only time you ever discard. This is a continuous variable. Um, vol of of KBRO three. Oops, KBRO three. Yeah, made a mess of that is a continuous variable continuous variable so no need to discard no need to discard uh two marks would have to adjust 
a just water vol to be same as others, same as others, and then plot at 8.5 centimeter cube vol on x axis. Seems very reasonable to me. Okay, all volume measures were measured using a 50 centimeter cube burette. Give a reason why the potassium is first measured into a separate boiling tube rather than directly. <laughs> why aren't they adding it from a burette? It takes ages. Burette is slow. Adding from a burette. Lol, I can understand that one though. It's clever that. Adding, whoops. Adding from burette take way too long. Burette is slow uh, and may affect result. And may affect result. Yeah, it's clever that. Two reasons why run one has the lowest uncertainty. It's going to have the largest volume. We know this. Run one, largest volume. Oh, and there's no water. So you've only got two, three points of error instead of four. Three points of error, everyone else has four points of error. Clever that. It's a two marks. Yeah. Largest vol of bromate taken. Bromate taken. So smaller percentage error. So smaller error in measurement. Number two, no water added. No water added. So only three sources of percentage error instead of four in others. Done. State the change that you would make to the procedure to obtain the data needed to determine the overall rate of reaction for the reaction between bromide, bro between bromide, bromate in acid conditions. Okay, so we know if you've got a reaction, so the overall order, where's the equation? There. So for us to work out the overall order, we've got to consider everybody that's going in this reaction. So I would need to find out the order with respect to bromate. This they did. Tick. I'd need to find the order with respect to the bromide and the order with respect to the acid. We're going to have to do two other experiments where we change everybody else but them. Sorry, exactly the opposite of that. I'm sorry, that made no sense. God, this is a long paper. So... Uh, repeat experiment, repeat experiment, uh, altering, altering vol of acid, of acid, keep all others same, comma, keep all others same, find order, Find order for acid. And then repeat, this is ridiculous. Repeat altering vol of KBR. KBR, keep all of the same, keep all others same. Find order, find order for KBR, add, add together add orders together. Bet that's the last part. Done. Okay, on to transition metals. Are we close to the end? This has been a long webinar already. Oh, am I on the last? Okay, last page. Nearly there, folks. Whew. I think, by the way, at this point, if I run out of time, like, where's the, well, how much time are we given for this? It's a tough paper, this guys. It has been tough. This awful lot of writing. I want to see what the, the word or how much what the time was. An hour and fifteen. I'm pushing it. I'm pushing it. I've done a lot of explaining though. I even plotted the graph. Right. Okay, transition metal M has two oxides. Okay. One is black. Uh, the this solid reacts with dilute nitric acid to form a blue blue solution. 
I'm going to say copper two plus straight away. And copper two plus copper copper does have two oxides. Copper two oxide, which is black, but it also has copper one oxide. Copper one oxide, which is white, I believe. So one centimeter of X is added to a tube. A few drops of sodium hydroxide solution, pale blue precipitate forms and does not redissolve. The formula of the transition metal cation is copper two plus. I'm happy with that. Cu two plus. Okay, one centimeter of X is added to a test tube. A few drops of ammonia. Yeah, we're going to form a blue precipitate, and then it will read as so. After a few drops, blue precipitate, pale blue. They said pale there, so I'll stick with that. Pale blue PPT forms, and then after adding excess, it will form a dark blue solution. Dark blue sol forms. Con this confirms the reference. That's absolutely right. So it is CO2 plus. A few drops of X are added to three centimeters cubed of concentrated hydrochloric acid. The color of the mixture is observed. The color of the mixture is going to be yellow. They'll probably allow green as well. The, the color seen is caused by the species CuCl42 minus copper chloride. One centimeter cubed of X is added to a test tube. Potassium iodide solution is added. Then a few drops of starch, so we know what the blue black is, is the iodine precipitate. A brown solution and a white solid is formed. The brown solution turns blue black. The substance causing the brown color is therefore iodine, iodine aqueous, and the white solid. So we've gone from iodide. We've gone from iodide to iodine, double it, two electrons. So the white solid is going to be the fact that I've gone from copper two plus, gained an electron to form copper one plus. Now that's interesting because I'd expected to form copper metal, but it's just apparently a white solid. It's probably going to be the copper one oxide. A reagent containing a compound of metal X produces a second oxide M when it is warmed with ethanol. Name the reagent ethanol, copper. Give me a sec. Oh, it's failings. <laughs> failings. Oh, yeah, it's failings. It's going to be failings. It's the only one. Yeah. Failings solution. That's clever. Give the formula of the second oxide. I thought I've already done that. A white solid form. I thought I've already done that. Identity by name or formula. Give the formula. Wait on a minute. So it starts off, failing starts off with copper two of this second oh, the reagent containing a compound of m produces a second oxide of m when it is warmed with ethanol ethanol blue to brick red containing compound of m what was m the original m we were doing X. Are they wondering which one it is of M? Blue to brick red. It's stupidly that. Describe what you see when carrying out this reaction. Blue solution to brick red PBT. And I'm done. That was hard. I've totally guessed that end is market. Right, I need to split my screen. Sorry, my mouse is rubbish. Gosh, that was hard. Now. Okay. Question one. 
Sulfuric reacts very exothermically with water, allow the, the reaction with acid is exothermic, okay? Sulfuric acid will shoot out of the container. The reaction is vigorous. Prevent splashing, I'll tell you one more. Brown, I like it, take it. Starch, freshly prepared starch solution. Starch complex form doesn't allow black precipitate. Nothing on flocking, that sucks. If added early, I'll give myself it. Black, forming a black insoluble solid, insoluble compound formed. Blue black to colorless. Identified, calculate. Within point one, values all in the table. Oh, have I made a mistake? Oh, no, I haven't. Allow. God, this one was hard. 74.6%. Nailed it. Nailed it. Yes. Take it. You watched my explanation. I hope you found it useful. Not 0.425. Mine's out. Mm, my answer doesn't fit quite theirs. Interesting. Mm. Wonder why. Over th oh five five. Why are they using five five? If I made a mistake. If I made a mistake. Why over five five? Oh, I just made a mistake. I lost it. I've lost one, guys. I made a mistake. I did over the four five. It should have been five five. Ha! Huh, number three, and I did number four. Oh, I lost it. So darn it. Weird that. Right, guys, my first error. My first error. Oh, I didn't. I used the wrong value. So I would definitely have lost that. Second mark for working out the other one. So it'd not be worth using it. Okay, so there's mine. So I'm happy with that one, so I only get one mark out of that. <laughs> one mark, Mr. Duncan, lost. RTFQ, I used the wrong value. I used number four instead of number three, and the question specifically asked you number three. Ha, <laughs> neat. Easily done, Mr. Duncan. Next, 0 0.116, 0 point, yay, I'll take it. I'll take it. Rams over rams first, yeah, all good. Okay, okay, and then two equations or multiples. Take it. Fine. Happy with that. Neutralize. React with HBr. Neutralize. React with acid to remove react with. Oh, wow! They even allowed remove excess bromine. They boiled it away though. Weird. Here's his round. Mine's proper. Concentrated nitric. Concentrated sulfuric. Phenol is corrosive, wear gloves. Right, I want to know that one. Allow it is caustic, allow phenol is toxic by skin absorption. So wear gloves. Do not award toxic, so use fume covered and corrosive on use. Okay, so I'll ignore use of fume covered. Yeah, phenol is on fume. It's not a gas, it's a solid. Okay, next one. Explain the purpose of the phenol. Reacts rapidly with the bromine formed when all the phenol is used up. Bleaches allow indicated color, allow phenol removes bromine. Do not award phenol as a solvent. Ignore reference to precipitate. Allow indicated decolorizers when all phenol to make the rate of reaction measurable because as it will be too fast. When all phenol is used up, excess bromine. So they wanted me to actually do a description. Well, I haven't done that. That's for sure. I'll give myself the first one but I've not got the second one. Make a note of Bene of that. Uh, so when all phenol used up, used up, uh, the indicator, indicator changes. Weird. Mm, whatever. Use a white tile. 
So they're asking you about me as Hans Hardman. So the volume of brim is proportional to concentration. Plots on the graph. Suitable choice of scale, more than 50%, which I have just, just, I'll take it there. First order. Oh, I've lost one. I've lost it. I didn't justify because of the straight line. I lost it. Lost another one. Oh, no. Don't forget RTFQ. Read the full question. Yeah, justify answer. Straight line. Oh, I lost it. Oh. The methyl red decolors early in the reaction when the concentration of reactant is linear on the gradient or tangent. Fine. Uh, reaction is contemplated by using. Uh, I definitely get it for my second one. Reaction produces lots within the linear section of the graph. Don't get anything for my first one. Meanies. I like my first one. It's better. Vol of potassium. The portions needed to be discarded. That needs to be what? Oh, need not be discarded. It's a continuous variable. As data is plotted on the graph. Actual vol of bromine is not important. Ignore reference to uncertainty. The portion need not be discarded. Total voltage. But the volume of one needs to be changed. I'll take that. Oh, do I have to give an example? It so need to. Oh, I've just made a mistake. So no need, no need. I've made a mistake. No, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I've lost all my marks. And I said that. Uh, so better. I need to be. I said it. I said it in the webinar. You guys know I said it. It needs not be discarded because it's a continuous variable. But I didn't write it. I lost it because I didn't write what I was saying. Waffling too much. We'd have to adjust the volumes. The others. Anyway, whatever. State what the water needs to be adjusted to. I feel like they're being overly picky there. If no other words, so the total water will still be 40. Oh, would have to adjust the water, vol, to be the same as the... I, I've not worded it very well. I'm going to be mean. I knew what I was saying and I lost it. Need to be better, Mr. Duncan. The burette would transfer the liquid too slowly. Inaccurate start. Yep. I quite like that. I should add that into my notes. Inaccurate start. Inaccurate start time. That's clever, that. That's why you can't use a Give two reasons for the lowest. 15 is the largest volume, so the lowest percentage of no water is added. I'll take both of those. Oh, God. Repeat experiment with various concentrations of varying vols of each adding the appropriate vol, keeping all the volumes the same. Keep all of them the same. I'm going to give myself at least one for that, maybe not two. Mm. I'd probably have actually got two there, but yeah. Transition metals, final bit of the lesson, it's cobalt. Oh, reject cobalt, oh gosh, bloody hell. CO2 plus, pale blue precipitate, dark blue solution, deep blue, lavender, reject lavender blue, allow royal blue, any wording that indicates that the solution is a darker blue, or dark, and dark blue, that's fine, thank goodness for that. Deep blue, ink blue, do they allow ink blue? Mm. Yellow, allow green, yeah. Iod brown solution, iodine, white solid. Copper one iodine, that's not copper one iodine. I've done oxide, it's iodide. Oh, I've lost it. It's copper one iodide. Of course it is. 
lose that mark. Eh, eh. Should have been copper one iodide. We'll just see, so I see why. Damn it, I was so close, so close. That makes sense that the oxide now appears. That makes total sense. Even I get it more. Blue solution to red brown. Allow brick red. Amazing. Wowzer. That was tough. It was tough, man. Guys, I'm done. Stop share. I'm finished, everybody. I hope you found it useful. That was hard, that, guys. Even I found that tough, found it quite tiring. It's difficult. Rate stuff was tough. Graph was tough. A couple of questions there I definitely need to work on my wording on. I hope you found it useful, everybody. I will see you all in school tomorrow. Take care, everybody.